Hello, and welcome to the Road to Autonomy podcast. I am your host, Grayson Brulte. The Road to Autonomy podcast is brought to you in part by Florida Internet and Television. It's time to cut the tax on tech. Welcome to another episode of the Road to Autonomy. On today's podcast, we're absolutely honored and frankly flattered to have Russ Mitchell from the LA Times on the podcast today. Hi, Russ. Hey, I'm flattered as well. <laughs> oh, thank you. Let's start it off by if you can just give a quick introduction and overview of yourself and the incredible work that you've been doing at the LA Times. Well, at the LA Times, um, I cover electric cars and driverless cars. A lot of my time is spent on Tesla. But I I really uh, am intrigued by autonomous driving as a uh, a real breakthrough in transportation whose effects will continue to uh, affect society for many years to come. What do you think some of those big changes are going to be? When we first had lunch years and years ago in, in Beverly Hills, we were talking about different forms of shuttles and different form factors. What do you think now fast forwarding what some of those form factors and different changes will be? Right. Well, it depends on how fast you forward. And the farther you get, the more uncertain the scenario uh, looks. Immediately, I spent some time just recently up in Orlando with a company called uh, Beep, which is using Navia shuttles at a planned community. They've only got one shuttle right now, but they're planning to add more. Beep actually is not doing the shuttles themselves, but the uh, the infrastructure and da- the data infrastructure behind it. And I think that you'll you'll start to see what's called geofenced. Probably most of your listeners know what that means. Autonomous vehicles that operate within set zones to uh, shuttle people in places like uh, retirement communities, college campuses, uh, hospitals, maybe Disney World from place to place. They move very slowly. They're pretty boring after you experience it for about five minutes. But I think that those are going to be some of the very early uh, iterations of this. But people are uh, working on uh, technologies for robo-taxis and trucks. And uh, I think that the development is going rapidly, not as rapidly as was promised a few years ago, when a lot of these companies were scratching for venture capital funding and uh, really being uh, maybe overly optimistic about how fast it would take. But nonetheless, they're progressing rapidly. And unless you're very old, even older than me, I think you're going to see trucks on the highway driving autonomously, and you're going to see robo-taxis ferrying people in geofenced areas and cities, and uh, it'll grow from there. It's interesting that you talked about trucks. And on March 2nd, Waymo announced they've raised their first external round of $2.2 billion. What stood out to me, and that more than anything, in the press release photo, there was a picture of an autonomous truck. Mm. And we're seeing a lot of companies that have worked on Autonomous ground vehicles such as Argo AI are now working on trucking. Aurora is now working on trucking. We have the Pure Play trucking startups with Too Simple and Embark and Kodiak. Do you see more companies having this bigger shift to autonomous trucking that we're starting to see? Do you see that really ramping up and growing? Absolutely, because trucking is probably the the best use case out there in terms of uh, making a profit. It's it's very difficult to find drivers now. People worry about the employment aspects of driverless trucks, but the fact is it's really hard to find truck drivers right now, and uh, it will be for some time to come. It's not really a pleasant job, and it doesn't pay enough to uh, make up for how unpleasant it is. And in terms of profitability, in terms of uh, the routes that the trucks take, for medium medium size and van size trucking, they can do uh, small routes within cities to deliver goods, even as tiny as the neuro vehicle that uh, NHTSA just approved for special exemption to go on the highways delivering, or not the highways, but the roadways delivering uh, groceries. But um, even in terms of long haul trucking, you've got highways, which are easier to navigate in autonomous systems. There's a lot of trucks on the highways. And uh, it makes a lot of sense to move in that direction. Particularly, you'll be able to platoon different trucks so that you would have a driver someplace in the chain of uh, trucking, probably in the lead vehicle, 
but have autonomous trucks platooned behind that, which means, you know, going very close together like a train. It's interesting that you mentioned platooning. There's been big debate in the industry of platooning is kind of an older technology. Platooning is going to be the answer. That's going to be interesting to see. But if we pivot back to Waymo for a second, so Waymo recently announced a partnership with UPS in Mm -hmm. the Phoenix metropolitan region to deliver goods. Right. Waymo is very public about their trucking. And with a $2.5 billion round of funding, when do you see Waymo, or sorry, in this case, Alphabet, breaking out revenue that Waymo has generated? So when the CEO of Alphabet is on an earnings call, he says, well, we have an update from our moonshots. And he says, Waymo has generated X amount of revenue. When do you see that? And then when do you see the interesting point that I'm looking for? When does Waymo break out trucking revenue separately from ground vehicle revenue? Well, that's an interesting question, and it's really up to Waymo, but I think that the, uh, and I wouldn't uh, deign to, to try to predict that, but I think that the funding is a clear sign that uh, Google plans to spin off Waymo at some point. And after that point, it'll depend on how much pressure there is from investors to break out uh, different revenue streams. Since uh, Google doesn't really like to break out streams in that way, uh, I doubt anything's going to happen before a spinoff. But if there's a spinoff, there's every opportunity for them to be more transparent with investors than uh, than Alphabet or Google wants to be. We'll see what happens. It's going to be interesting. And in going back to 1983, you were a Vanver Bush Fellow in Science and Technology at MIT, where you study corporations and how they manage research and development. Mm-hmm. What did you learn from that, and how can you take what you learned from that class at, at MIT to what we're seeing currently in the markets today? Technology startups were still fairly new. You had uh, companies like Intel and Fairchild before that in the 70s that were really making waves, and uh, companies were starting to uh, become very concerned about that, understood the need to be innovative. So they tried any number of techniques to try to encourage innovation within their ranks, The problem with big bureaucracies is that they are big bureaucracies, and uh, it's often hard to uh, achieve that kind of change. Some companies did better than others. You have companies like 3M, for instance, that has been innovative and uh, down to the uh, individual scientist level throughout its history, and it continues to be. They haven't come up with dramatic breakthroughs, like other than maybe post-it notes, but uh, they're they're doing iterative uh, innovations all the time, and they they continue to be a very successful company. Uh, Lockheed did things like create a Skunk Works project that would be totally separate from the bureaucracy. A lot of companies followed that route, but it's still it continues to be a big uh, problem for big companies, and that's why you're seeing companies setting up venture capital arms and companies purchasing startups because it's it is so it's continued to be despite the best efforts corporate culture is such that uh, big companies have a hard time innovating they're doing the best they can and uh, purchasing startups and starting venture capital funds to identify upcoming startups is uh, are two big ways they're doing that it's a question whether facebook or amazon or uh Google and such will get so big that they have trouble. They won't have trouble innovating because they're they're buying startups, but integrating those startups into their companies is also a big challenge for big bureaucratic operations. And it remains to be seen uh, how well they'll be able to do that. And you're seeing that today. Uh, you mentioned Facebook. You're seeing that with WhatsApp. You know, Facebook is a large publicly traded behemoth. Mm-hmm. And on one sense, you have the the investors that want growth, growth, growth at all costs. Then you have the investors that want to see, well, you have to grow the profit margins. And the big debate inside of Facebook, it seems to be from a public markets perspective, is putting advertising on WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. Or the agreement with Facebook and between the WhatsApp founders that we want to put advertising on that. If putting my investor hat on at some point, you will have advertising on WhatsApp. When you sell a company as a, so let's say you're Russ, the startup founder, and and you sell a company to let's call it Acme Corporation and you do really well. And in that contract, you have a two to three year period where you stay on. Right. How much, based on you know your, your stuff that you've done at MIT, how much influence do you think that you have from studying this that you would have during that two to three year contract period? It depends on the company, how good you are and how much respect they have for you. It can vary anywhere from having incredible cloud and influence 
to having absolutely none. And when the, when you have no clout, is that the time when everybody leaves? The wise people do. <laughs> it's almost fun. every almost everybody does. If if it becomes clear that uh, you're not really you can't run the show anymore, but if you are playing no part in running the show, anybody who's been that success is successful enough to sell their company to a company like Facebook or whoever is smart enough to know when it's time to get out and either retire or do something uh, do something else. And speaking of super successful individuals who show no desire to retire and are constantly tweeting and building new companies brings me to none other than Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. You've started in 2019 covering Tesla on a regular... 2016. 2016, wow. On a regular basis for the LA Times. And you had this really interesting story last year called the crowdsourced social media swarm that is betting Tesla will crash and burn. Mm Mm-hmm. It seems that Tesla is one of the most loved brands and one of the most hated brands with no middle, kind of like how the country is. You're, it's, it's, po- it's polar opposite divided. Yes. What were the origins of, of that incredible story that you wrote? Well, the story looked at uh, specifically short sellers at Tesla who set up a network. Actually, the network organically grew on Twitter I focused on the people who were flying planes and setting up cameras to find out what Tesla's production levels really were. But the network is the most important and interesting aspect. Uh, There's a group that uh, calls itself Tesla Q. The Q uh, is the symbol that NASDAQ uses for a bankrupt company. And uh, these short sellers believe that Tesla was bound to crash, spent uh, some money on that. And and unlike previous periods, were able to communicate among themselves uh, in real time uh, with uh, real time data about what was happening at Tesla, including the reports from people who were uh, flying over, you know, Tesla's uh, manufacturing plants or storage facilities, etc. Just like the country is becoming tribal in politics and in other regards. I think you're seeing, particularly with the sexier companies out there, you're getting people who love the company and people who hate the company able to, whereas in the past they might have just, you know, mouthed off to their neighbors or their broker, they're able to uh, communicate with one another and uh, create new research methods and systems to make their case. And you've got... And at the same time, you got somebody like Elon Musk, who, for whatever reason, and I haven't totally figured it out, engenders deep love or deep hate. And most Americans probably, you know, don't care one way or the other. But on the margins, you've got a real tribe that loves, loves, loves Elon Musk. He can do no wrong. He's the savior of the universe, and if or he's the savior of the Earth, and if he can't save the Earth, we'll go to Mars and uh, continue on there. And then you've got another tribe that sees him as a total fraud, and uh, using uh, subsidies from the government to uh, build a company that can't make a profit, and willing to use fraudulent accounting mechanisms to pretend he's using a profit to raise more money and keep keep alive. But the interesting thing about the bulls and the bear fight on Tesla and this, the, the Reddit threads and the Twitter threads are that they just go at one another all day. Yeah. I mean, it's really, truly amazing. How many of these individuals are actually trading the stock? Do you have any insight into that? Or is this just, just it depends pure on how wide you want the universe to be. So uh, I've been, I'm on Twitter. I follow a bunch of these people. And uh, I've been able to pick out the bulls who really seem to be trading the stock and the shorts who really seem to be uh, involved. Although, you know, lately with the stock price going as crazy as it's gone, a lot of them have cashed out their positions. Uh, yet they're, they're sticking to their guns that this is a fraud and it will be revealed in, in due time. But um, you've got a real mix with the hardcore people that trade numbers back and forth are involved in trading the stock. So it's not just uh, casual fanboys and haters who are trading insults, which happens, but you can block those people. Yeah, but where does this, an overarching theme is this origins of fraud. Yeah. Was there an incident in the past or incidents in the past that have caused 
the speculation around oranges of fraud or where where do you any any insight of where that emerged from? Sure. Elon Musk was accused by the SEC of being a fraud and he settled the case agreeing that he could not deny that he was accused of being a fraud. Uh, this revolves around for people who don't know a tweet where he said he was taking the company private at uh, $420 a share which uh, at the 420 seems to be uh, kind of a uh, a riff on uh, on pot smoking but uh, I'll leave it to the listeners to decode that and in fact it was untrue he has wanted to burn short sellers and this is one of his attempts to do that there are other areas where uh, you know the way he counts sales is he doesn't say the word sales. He says the word deliveries. So people wonder where those things are being sold, who they're being sold to. What's a delivery versus a sale? Tesla won't say. Uh, factory gated sales doesn't really define what that means. You know, I'm not taking a stand on whether it's a fraud or not, but I will say, in my experience covering business for old guy here, like going on 40 years, there is a lot of sketchy stuff going on with Tesla accounting. That's fascinating. When you first published your crowdsourced article on April 8th, 2019, Tesla shares closed at 273.20. And since then, shares have rallied over to $900, burning the short sellers to a tune of over $12 billion in 2020 alone before the coronavirus spooked the markets. Having lost $12 billion, what is the next move for the, the Tesla Q and the, and the Tesla bears? Well, if you if you hadn't lost all that money, you'd have enough money to buy in, to short the stock at $900 a share, which to me, well, I won't say what I think. Oh, there please are, do. There, well, there are, peop there are people who, who say that uh, it's a much more obvious short at $900. I mean, you look at the stock market in general and what's been happening in the last few days with the coronavirus, you know, there's there are people who say that that's a, a much more obvious short at 900. There are still people who have lost a lot of money that see the stock as a $50 stock or a zero stock because, in fact, they haven't made any money across the corporation by selling cars. They've been unprofitable every year for 17 years. So it's kind of hard to justify a stock price at 150 billion or so when you've never made a profit. The believers say that uh, they're going to really make their mark in autonomous driving and advanced battery technology, but we haven't we haven't seen the evidence of that. Maybe they're right. Uh, maybe they're right. The autonomous driving is one thing, but to me, it seems that there are individuals in the market that are buying Tesla, not for Elon, not for the tech, but the, for the fact that it's a pure play EV company with a brand that they can relate to. So I think there's money flowing in that way. The autonomous driving, and you stepped into this one mm. with, with Tesla, right? where around the, the marketing of autopilot, mm -hmm. and we, I'll speak for myself and for a lot of individuals, and uh, the chairman of the NTSB board came out and said the same thing that I'm about to say, a Tesla is not a self-driving car. You cannot go into a dealer today you cannot go on an iPad or an iPhone and order a self-driving car for purchase. You can order a semi-self-driving car to take you for a ride in Las Vegas in a lift, but you cannot buy a self-driving car. Well, it depends on whether you're listening to the uh, safety regulators or listening to Tesla, because the safety regulators say, and it's true, these are not self-driving cars. If you read the owner's manual in the fine print, it becomes very clear that it's not a self-driving car, that you have to keep your hands on the wheel. If you watch Elon Musk with his hands off the wheel, you might get a different impression. And the most significant thing is that on their website, for $7,000, you can buy something called full self-drive capability. What does that mean? To me, it means full self-drive capability, which means it's a self-driving car. Is that deceptive marketing? That's not for me to say. It's for the uh, Federal Trade Commission or buyers to say. But uh, I think it's a question that everybody should be asking. I agree with that. And we'll leave that to people, individuals smarter than us to, to make that conclusion around, around marketing. Right. It's clear that it's being marketed. And I gave a talk yesterday and 
told a story, which is an important story to tell. And I'll re- remove names for, for privacy purposes. But mm-hmm. I was at a, uh, an event and a really nice event. And this, this older um, individual, she was probably in her, let's say, mid-70s, had a little too much to drink. And I said, ma'am, may I order you an Uber to take you home? Mm-hmm. No, no, no. You don't understand. I got a Tesla. It's a self-driving car. It's going to get me home. Yeah. And I said, ma'am, I'm very sorry to inform you. It's not going to get you home. May, if you're not comfortable in an Uber, may I get you a taxi or can I ask? We were, it was, the event was at a hotel. May I uh, have the house car take you home so we can ensure you're home safely? No, no, no. It's a self-driving car. That's what they sold me. I'm telling you that's what they sold me. And you know, through the help of an intermediary, we finally got her to go in the house car. And she did not get in her, her Tesla to drive her home. Good for you. That's just one incident that I've seen, and I've been um, in Teslas where they've done things in autopilot that they shouldn't have done, um, driven off the highway. If anybody lives in California, try and do the 101-405 interchange in Los Angeles in autopilot. You get the red screen of crash intimate, or try driving on the 101 to Santa Barbara in the the far right lane. You'll go off the, the, the highway. That is not a self-driving car. Exactly. The, um, I've driven Teslas many times and, uh, autopilot works great until it doesn't. And I I noticed that Elon Musk is never, even though the legal material, uh, says when you buy a Tesla that you have to pay attention. Elon Musk has never on his Twitter account or speaking said, look, this isn't a self-driving car. He's never done that. The NTSB was looking at an accident, a crash, where a uh, driver in Mountain View crashed into a concrete barrier while on autopilot. He was playing a video game, so it was his fault, in part. He was, But the autopilot also crashed the car into a concrete barrier. So clearly the technology is not self-driving technology, or it would have adjusted to that barrier and not crashed the car. I think that uh, the company makes very nice vehicles. They drive great. They look great for the most part. I don't like the Model X, but the, the other two cars look nice. But they, they shouldn't be selling it as self-driving cars because it's, it's really irresponsible to pretend that these things can drive themselves and people are dying as a result. It's irresponsible and there are these crashes and it's a sad narrative that's happening. And, you know, these families have lost, you know, loved ones and mm-hmm. the pain that they're going through is insurmountable. And, right. and, you know, we hope those families can deal with that pain. Looking at the autonomous vehicle industry as a whole, what, if any negative detriment effect, do you think that these autopilot crashes are having on the industry? Is this, is this starting to erode public trust where it's, where when you see a Tesla get an accident autopilot, the headlines and not your paper, but in other outlets and, and blogs is self-driving car gets an accident and then they go and they sell X more amount of papers or, or more page impressions. Do you think that the media is partially responsible for, for driving that narrative around to self-driving? That's an interesting question. I don't cover just Tesla. I cover uh, driverless car companies in general. I was just at uh, Argo mm-hmm. today in Miami, which is owned by Ford. It's not just Argo, but Waymo, other driverless companies. They really are focused on safety. They really seem committed, based on what they're telling me, to safety because they know that the public is going to have to accept this and they won't accept it if it proves to be unsafe. Even if it's safer than human drivers, statistically, if there are robot cars getting in a lot of accidents and a lot of fatal accidents, it could kill the industry. And I believe, as I think anybody with a uh, a rational frame of mind and willing to do the research will conclude that if robots can drive, robots should be able to drive cars theoretically safer than human beings. And I think that that's very possible. And I I believe that this technology will, will ultimately save a lot of lives. But if the public loses faith because of a company that may or may not be irresponsible, 
it will hurt the entire industry. I agree with that. Not only is that hurting the industry, you know what's hurting the industry almost more than that? California disengagement reports. <laughs> okay. They're creating, they're, it's going and creating false narratives. Kyle Vogt, co-founder and CTO in a, in a length of Cruise in a lengthy medium post called the California disengagement reports, woefully inadequate. Waymo, in a, in a statement on Twitter, said, we appreciate what the California DMV was trying to do when creating this requirement, but the disengagement metric does not provide relevant insights into the capabilities of the Waymo driver or distinguish his performance from others in the self-driving space. Oliver Cameron, co-founder and CEO of Voyage on Twitter, said, the standards of reporting from each company is so comically different that there's really nothing you can take away. It seems that the data that is required in California has created a quote unquote leaderboard where driving in San Francisco is completely different than driving in Los Angeles versus San Diego versus Fresno versus Sacramento. Why do you think that California created these disengagement reports and how do we get them to go away? Both good questions. Uh, the second question is a, uh, is an opinionated question, which uh, I don't feel uh, like I need to wade into, but, but, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a legitimate question. When California allowed uh, driverless cars in an experimental way to, to go on public roads, they did two major things. They did lots of other things too, but the two major things were to require accident reports and disengagement reports. Now, the industry feels like the accident reports are a little bit too onerous, but they, they say that uh, they understand why the state might have done that. And uh, you can hardly argue with, you know, the idea of reporting what the accident reports are. So that's, that's not a big deal. Disengagement, I can't figure out why they did it. They can't explain why they did it. And I agree with, uh, with all those who say they don't make sense. All you need to know, if you're not following this closely, is that a company that's pushing the edges a little bit more will disengage more than a company that's not. So they could be operating entirely safely, but pushing the edges a little bit more about how close to a curb they want to go when they're trying to avoid a bicyclist. And that will disengage more than somebody that's actually closer to a cyclist and doesn't try to avoid the cyclist. And the company that has more disengagements will be viewed by the general public as being the more dangerous company. I mean, it, it just, I can't fathom it. That's all true. And do you think that due to that, do you think partially that is why Waymo, the Google self-driving car project is testing and, and Chandler and Argo is testing in Miami? Do you think those are one of the main driving factors or do you think they just see market opportunities? Yeah, I, I, and let me, let me, I was talking about a bicyclist. I was talking about an oncoming bicyclist yeah. and then moving closer to the curb. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, you'd, you'd run the bicyclist down. Uh, just, I just wanted to clarify that. I'm actually working on a story right now about uh, other states. Florida and Arizona seem to be uh, states that are uh, favored states for driverless car developers to uh, try things out in, in, in real life. It's a little bit too early in my reporting to come to a conclusion on that. But uh, if you want to uh, talk to me after, uh, after I finish the reporting about whether California is open or not to not the technological development, but the business development of driverless cars, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you at that time. I'm personally looking forward to reading your story. I know that there's a lot of individuals reading your story. And as a, a, a teaser or as a highlight, is there a certain nugget that you could share that will be featured in your, in your story? There seems to be a more welcoming attitude in places like Florida and Arizona and Texas California has a lot of bureaucracy, and some of it is, just as the disengagement reports indicate, kind of hard to understand. For instance, the Public Utilities Commission has a say in driverless cars because they will set the fares for robo-taxis. Waymo has a uh, pilot project in Silicon Valley where employees are using uh, driverless uh, Waymo vehicles as robo-taxis. Uh, Waymo would like to start charging uh, uh, money and get the general public involved. Uh, Zooks and several other companies want to do the same thing. But uh, so far, the PUC is on a months and possibly years long study about whether they should allow that or not. And um, they don't really want to explain how much is charged for a robotaxi ride 
how it relates to safety or anything else. I talked to officials in Arizona, Florida, Texas, Michigan. They'll all get on the phone with me. In California, really tough. They just don't want to talk about it. You're one of the most honest, thoughtful reporters covering not just mobility, but the whole automotive industry as a whole. And we can't thank you enough for for coming on the podcast and sharing this um, wonderful insight with us today. Well, thank thank you for saying so. And if I have a a, a second, I invite uh, the California officials to uh, to get back to me. I want to do a fair, objective story. And uh, the more people that uh, talk to me and let me know what's going on, the clearer, more accurate, and more fair I can be. Yeah, and California officials, I'll tweet this podcast episode at you. And um, it's the state of California, um, you know, has been at the forefront of mobility and autonomy. And the state needs to tell its story. And there's no better individual than Russ Mitchell at the LA Times to tell that story. I'm sure you have him in your pre- uh, on file in your press office and give him a buzz. And we all look forward to Russ writing that story and to Russ as the public reading that story. So the future's bright, the future's autonomous. And thank you very much for listening to The Road to Autonomy. Thanks, Grace. Thanks, Russ. Thank you for listening to The Road to Autonomy podcast. If you've enjoyed listening, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Want to get in touch? Follow us on Twitter at Road to Autonomy or email podcast at B-R-U-L-T-E-C-O dot com. The Road to Autonomy is produced by Brulte and Company. The views and opinions expressed on the Road to Autonomy podcast do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Brulte and Company. The content discussed in this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal, tax, investment, or business advice.